sure it all works, right? Right. Right. So this would be an opportunity when you could pull out your uh, Ethernet tester, your XFO. Remember, we did this yesterday, so I'm not going to do it again. But uh, do some kind of a testing on it here. Uh, you could send a fixed number of packets. Uh, you could uh, run an RFC 2544 test with it. Uh, you know, whatever you need to do to measure it, you could pull it out and do it now. If you, when you, I don't have one of these guys. It would be awful nice, but mm -hmm. you know, not in the budget. Do you loop the other side? Is that what you, you do? You what I do when I test um, in the field, uh, it's a little bit harder than Apex Plus, but with the Giga Plus, is I just on the far side have to run a cable from one to two, and then on my near side I just plug into one and two. Oh, okay. So I just test it that way. Okay. You could do it with a loopback device, uh, or with an Apex Plus, you can go from the use a copper module mm -hmm. and go from the copper into the back into the real copper. No copper. Um, so that, that's what I typically do when I'm testing. Is I'll just use that, and that way I don't have to do any kind of loopback, and I do a full. I mean, a complete full duplex test mm -hmm. that way there. Because the radios are full duplex, you don't really see any difference. The only difference you'd see is the latency is double because you're seeing it both ways. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, that's the way I would run my test. So instead of 10 nanoseconds, you'll see 20? Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you don't have the tester, there's other stuff we'll you know talk about how to do and what to test in the radio here. Okay. So remember we had that uh, checklist earlier about the site installation checklist. Well, we got another one of those here for your link commissioning. Uh, again, it's in an appendix in the back of the manual. A good thing to be able to reference. A uh, great thing to be fill out. If you don't fill this out, at least hit the status save button for me so you've got something to compare to. But uh, it would be great if you went through it and you, you filled this out. I can't tell you how many times in troubleshooting a problem with a the customer, they've gone back and looked at this and they've solved the problem on their own. I ask them for the paperwork, they go and find the paperwork, they tell me they figured out the problem. Okay? It could be that the RSI was negative 40 and now the RSI is negative 60 and they go, oh, well, our alignment must be off and they go fix the alignment. Uh, you know, it could be something else, I can't say exactly. But uh, it is worth your you know, 10 minutes, it'll take you to fill that out. Especially if you're signing this over to a, a customer like AT&T who wants 540 pictures. So what we're going to do, we're going to validate the uh, link settings, verify some traffic stability, make any kind of fine tuning, and then record this as we discuss here. Okay. So signal quality. Okay. Status modem or link test, or that little thing at the top of the page is what you're going to be looking at here. Okay. Link test gives you everything on one line. Remember we already talked in the CLI, you can do link test 99 or link test 10 or 20 or whatever to see some number of iterations of that. Uh, status modem gives you a lot of the same information, but gives it to you in a different layout. Um, I tend to like the link test because it's just very concise, tells you everything you need to know. Okay. Uh, if you do the status modem, all of those locks need to be one. If you do link test, you only need to worry about the one lock needing to be one. Uh, what we're really looking for here is going to be the NSE, okay? Uh, but the RSSI should match your expected. 3 dB. Okay. Then when we're looking at the signal quality, we're looking at the MSE. I've told you all along, MSE is just like signal to noise ratio. Well, here's a little bit more on it. Um, signal to noise ratio only looks at the signal and the noise. Okay, so it doesn't look at errors and anything else that goes with that. It just knows my signal is at negative 40, the noise is at negative 80. I've got 40 dB of signal. To noise. MSE is calculated differently. Uh, it's the mean squared errors and it accounts for distortion and interference in addition to just noise power. So it's a little bit better of a calculation to use, uh, but other than the fact that it's negative, you could use it just like signal to noise ratio, okay? I'm gonna change these numbers a little bit later on today for you, but I'm gonna make it easy for you to begin with, okay? Negative 32 or better is what you're looking for regardless of your setting, okay? Uh, 36 would be better than 32, okay? Smaller number, but... Yeah. 28 would be worse than 32, and would be the absolute maximum at which the link would work at Qualm 256, okay? If you don't have ACM on, and your link has an MSE of 27, 
you're running at link 256, either the link will be completely unlocked or you'll be losing traffic left and right because it's, it's corrupting traffic because it's passing. Okay. So we can tell a lot just by looking at this MSC. Okay. So you run a link test 99. We are hoping to see the MSC be 32, 34, 36, something like that. A lot of the new radios, um, when they're installed properly and aligned properly and you don't have any cable issues, you're going to see MSC at 36, maybe even 38. Okay. You do need to check this on each side. Okay. So at the top of the web page, you can see it both, you know, shows you local, active, and remote. So you want to look at both of those. Um, in the CLI, I didn't show you this today, but you could do status space remote to see the far side status in the CLI. Uh, but typically, you'd log into both, run the link test 99 or whatever on both sides. You can get an idea of if there's any fluctuation. This should not be fluctuating more than about a dB or so. Same with the RSSI. We do not expect to see much fluctuation. Okay. This is a good time to start your SNMP monitoring, which we talked about earlier. Okay. Whether it's PRTG or whatever other program, you start that monitoring, turn off the status logging in the radio, and start monitoring this every minute, or maybe even less, you know, every couple, uh, you know, 15 seconds or 30 seconds for the first day or so, just to see if there's any fluctuation. Okay, there really should not be much fluctuation here. Okay, BER is a bit air rate. Uh, essentially, uh, our data sheets are published to the bit air rate of 10 to the minus 6, which would equate to 1 out of a million bit errors. Okay, so 1 error out of a million packets totally sent. That's where that receive sensitivity number comes from. On that data sheet, on that last page where we had the receive sensitivity, that is the RSSI at which point you're going to have a link that is 10 to the minus 6 or 1 in a million or better bit error rate. Okay? If your RSSI is less than that, then you're going to start seeing bit error that you can detect. Now, say, okay, well, one to, you know, that one out of a million that doesn't sound very good. Well, it is, it is, you, know, you are seeing errors. You will see errors in general. However, on our products, you're very likely to not see any errors. Okay. We use a lot of uh, forward error correction, which improves our MSC, improves our sensitivity, and it's very rare to see actual bit error. We'll talk in troubleshooting uh, about when you do see it, what it means. Some other manufacturers, I'm not exactly sure who is doing this anymore, but some will use a 10 to the minus 3 number uh, to, for a better receive sensitivity. Um, but uh, just keep that in mind uh, that you don't get uh, deceived by that. Uh, for old microwave, when we're talking about you know, primarily telephonic traffic, we could use a 10 to the minus 3 bit error. But uh, with data applications, 10 to the minus 6 is about all it's going to tolerate. Okay? Anything more than 1 in a million, and your data application is going to see that. Okay? So after we validate the signal is, is good, and again, that's just really looking at the MSC, making sure it's not fluctuating and that it's expect where it's expected to be. Okay, 34, 36, something like that. We're going to verify our data ports. This is where you'd want to pass some form of traffic. This is where you'd plug in your Expo, your Xena, or whatever. Remember, if you don't have one, you can rent one. They're really not that expensive to rent for a day. I just rented one to do some testing in our lab over the last couple weeks. The one I rented was $80 a day. Uh, you know, Ethernet tester is probably even cheaper than that. This was all sorts of crazy 10 gig and stuff. Um, if you don't have a tester, Okay, you can use your iPerf. You can use a laptop with ping, okay? Ping back and forth across the link. Uh, you can do some FTP downloads. You can do a speedtest.net. Something to verify that there's actually some kind of traffic going across there. I like doing something that's going to fix the number, okay? Send a million packets, send a million pings. Then you could look at the port counters and see that a million came in and a million went out. 
makes it very easy to see. You could do a 10 million, you could do it a 100 million, you could do it a billion, whatever. Do it a nice, even, round number, and you can check and see where that data went. We want to follow the data through the path. When we were looking at the port counters in the web interface, uh, and I, don't think, I didn't show you in the CLI, but status port would be the command of the CLI today. Uh, you want to look for uh, the Ethernet in to the uh, Ethernet out, RF out, then on the other side, RF in to Ethernet out. And you should see that million all the way through. Remember yesterday when I did that ACM test and I did the 200,000 I sent at the expo? We didn't look at it in the radio, but just on the expo. It sent 200,000, we received 200,000. That's the best way to know if there's any kind of a problem. Because if you send 200,000 and only 190,000 came, then you know you have an issue. Obviously, it's very hard to do once you have live traffic on the link because you can't control the numbers. But before you put traffic on, they're very easy to just send a thousand or a million or a billion, whatever the number is. Question. Yeah. If you have a perfect link and don't have any signal loss or anything like that and you're seeing errors, what's the most likely cause? You're seeing errors somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> so it has to do with RF. Something's not right. With either you've, either you've got an issue on the ports, which you'd see looking at the status port, CRC's coming in, something like that, uh, or if there is something going on across the air. So the MSC values, uh, you can see that for both the wired interface and the RF? Well, the MSC is just going to be for the receive over the wireless. Okay. Um, but that's where you would check coming into the radio. So if I send a million packets from my Exo tester or my laptop, whatever, um, and I'm only getting 800,000 on the other side. When I look at status port in the radio, I'm going to quickly see where I lost them. If I see a million in the Ethernet, but only 800,000 out the RF, I don't even need to look at the RF because I lost it in the first radio. Said it had a, a million in, but only 800,000 went out, then that radio, something happened internally to it, and those packets didn't come out. Maybe I. I burst it too fast. I pushed the traffic faster than the modem could handle. Remember, the modem can only handle 375 megabits or whatever you have it set to. So if you try to send it a full gigabit with iPerf, it's not going to work. It's going to drop a lot of that traffic. Uh, briefly, the way that iPerf works in my personal experience is that it bursts traffic at line rate. It's actually kind of a law. It's the only way it can do it. If you want to send uh, traffic from here to there, and I've got a gigabit interface, the only possible speed for me to send it at is actually gigabit. gigabit interface. Uh, when you use an Expo or some other kind of a tester, what it does is it pauses between each packet to maintain a consistent interframe gap when you tell it to send 100 megabits when you're plugged into a gigabit interface. So it'll send a packet, wait, send a packet, wait, send a packet, wait, send a packet, wait. When you do that with iPerf, in my experience, uh, it's going to send a burst of traffic, then wait, send a burst, then wait, send a burst, then wait. So for purposes of illustration, I want to send 100 megabits, but I've got a gigabit interface. I could send a gigabit for a tenth of a second and do nothing for nine tenths of a second. Then send a gigabit for a tenth of a second and do nothing for nine tenths of a second. Well, on an average, I'm sending 100 megabits, right? The radio sees way too much traffic. You're not doing anything. You're not doing anything. You're not doing anything. way too much. Not doing anything. Not doing anything. Way too much. Not doing anything. So we take that gigabit burst that comes in for that first tenth of a second. We're able to get 30% of it across the link. We buffer maybe another 30% of it, and now we only get uh, 60 megabits across the link because it was bursting. If it sent it, you know, for a tenth of a second and then waited and then a tenth of a second and waited and a tenth of a second and waited shorter time periods, it would work better. Uh, in my experience, all of the software-based applications, which all seem to be based on iPer, uh, have that issue because they don't have the control to really space the IFG because they're relying on an operating system that's not made for testing Ethernet traffic. It's made for getting that traffic out of its memory as fast as it possibly can. And so it doesn't have the intelligence for it. I think that's a way off topic of your question.
but uh, with the status port, you'd be able to see I'm getting a million in, but only 800,000. You have to look at the next radio. But if you did look at the next radio, you'd see 800,000 in and 800,000 out. You would know, okay, the problem is over here. The problem must be bursting. Do you have like a buffer overload event on this as well? Um, we don't at this point. We've talked about adding like golden, right something to, to indicate it. The problem is you're always going to see it. So if we add it, it's just going to be a counter that's incrementing constantly because Ethernet traffic is bursty by nature. Um, a problem in life, actually, is that we've built larger and larger and larger buffers into products, which is, in my personal opinion, the worst thing ever we could have done. TCP traffic is made around dropping a packet. It's the whole way the window size works. So they keep increasing the window size until it drops, and then it'll, it'll decrease the window size, and then it's going to keep increasing the window size until it drops a packet. The problem when we buffer packets is we don't drop them. We buffer them. But the first packet in the sequence comes in with no delay, and the last packet in the sequence comes in, you know, 10 seconds later, potentially. Ridiculously long time because we get these big buffers. Now, imagine you've filled up this buffer, and now you get this high priority packet that you really don't want to drop, a UDP packet coming from your VoIP phone. Well, if you didn't have any kind of quality of service, that UDP packet would be stuck at the back of that buffer. And in my extreme example, if you had 10 seconds of buffering, you'd wait 10 seconds before you got that packet. Now, your download happened a little bit faster. You got your latest version of iTunes or whatever downloaded, but your phone call was dropped because it can't handle 10 seconds of latency. Can you hear me now? Um, does your uh, QoS, layer 3 QoS, detect that and put it in front of the buffer? So the QoS would work with that and make sure that that high priority packet is, is expedited. Um, we also have a very rel relatively small buffer because there's no reason to have a large buffer in this product. Um, we're, not, we're not managing the stuff. If you've got TCP traffic that's bursting over what we can handle, it's fine. It's going to drop it. That's what it should do. Um, if you go on our forums or support tringosys.com and you search for buffer bloat or even just buffer, I think you'll find a link <laughs> to uh, a, a pretty good uh, podcast uh, on buffer bloat. Uh, and I think there's a website, bufferbloat.com or .org or something. Search Google for buffer bloat, the first thing you find. Uh, that really goes into talking about buffers and why bigger buffers are really not a good thing um, and why bursting kind of gotten out of control. But um, that, anyways, is kind of the issue with, with IFER. So it's way off topic. But useful information.